Hey everyone. So here we're going to go over uh, the short story that you had to read for homework last week, uh, the last short story of our series, and it was Speech Sounds by Octavia Butler. We're going to go ahead and uh, go through the PowerPoint here. Um, it's a very strange story. Uh, it's really easy to sort of not really understand what's going on. Um, and even if you kind of understand what's going on, we still never really get like a true explanation of what started all of this. Uh, we're just sort of plopped into the middle of it and we do the best we can to, to put the pieces together um, as to you know the events that led up to this story. Um, you know, we again, we just kind of do the best we can at the beginning and make our way through the story. And even if we sort of Put the pieces together the story is still a little on the strange side um, which i guess sort of makes sense this is not something that we've ever experienced so reading through it we're a little less certain of what to expect right so it's it's a little off-putting in some ways but a really uh interesting read i think so let's go over a little brief summary of the story here first thing you need to know about speech sound um, actually, the first thing you need to know is when it was written, which was it was first published in 1983. And that is very important to realize because we read through some of this story, we can easily make some connections to events that have transpired in our lifetime, specifically over the last few years with the pandemic, with the, um, with COVID. Uh, and a lot of people might jump to that assumption that this is a recent piece of literature, but it's not. It was, it was first published in 1983, right? Biggest thing you need to know about the actual story is that it takes place in the not so distant future, even from us now, even though it was written in 83, the world that seems to be reflected isn't much different than where we still are today. It's not like this is, you know, super futuristic, like sci-fi kind of deal. Um, it is in a way, but not what we typically think of as sci-fi, like thousands of years in the future. That's, this is still pretty much in our lifetime where this is happening, right? But it's taking place um, in the not so distant future in which a pandemic of some sort and this is where we're still left with questions. We never really learned anything about this pandemic, what caused it, where it came from. We, we have no clue. Even by the end of the story, the, the, the questions we have about the actual illness or virus or whatever it is are still unanswered. We just know that something has happened worldwide that has left humans without the ability to speak read or write. Now that doesn't mean that not one single person can speak, read or write. It means that some people can still speak normally, verbal communication, but they can no longer read or write. Or vice versa, some people can still read and write and understand communication in that way, but they no longer have the ability to speak or understand verbal communication. So at the heart of this pandemic is communication issues, the ability for people to communicate effectively, right? It begins with Rye, who is our main character. Um, she's traveling through Los Angeles on a bus. A fight breaks out among some of the passengers, which forces the driver to pull over she waits outside for the um, outside the bus for the fight to be broken up and the bus ride to resume. Um, and you know, during this, all of this, you know, she kind of makes little comments to, the, or the narrator kind of picks up on things like how public transportation isn't easy to come by these days. There's just a lot of really weird little clues that, while it it's easy to think that this is normal, it's really not. Um, you know, 
why are these people having this argument on the bus anyway? Um, why is she waiting outside the bus? Why is she so concerned with getting back on the bus? Because she really needs to finish this commute that she's trying to make because public transportation is easy to come by. Um, so lots of little hints there in the first few paragraphs of the story. But while the bus driver is trying to defuse this situation and stop the fight, a man in a police uniform pulls up in a car. And again, Rye notes how odd this is because there's no longer any kind of law enforcement or government, not to mention how rare it is to see someone actually driving a car because fuel and mechanics are even harder to come by than the random public buses. This is a really weird world we're living in right now. But the man in the police uniform uses a gas bomb to break up the fight on the bus but he stands back and refuses to engage um, with any of the passengers or the bus driver. Um, you know, he just kind of tries his best to break it up, but from afar. And he catches Rye's attention and indicates that she can leave with him if she wants, like in his car. Uh, and she could, you know, she's, she's not real sure. Uh, she can't be sure of anybody, you know, in this world. But ultimately she decides to leave with him and because she realizes that he is one of those who has been less affected by the virus, much like herself. So um, those who are less affected seem to be more reasonable. They are less likely to be driven by fear and anger. So we have sort of this split. There's two different splits actually put it that way. We have those who can still speak and understand spoken language and those who can only still read and write. That's the first split. The second split is, has to do with whether you're right-handed or left-handed. And again, this is never explained. We have no, no details, no explanations about this pandemic, how it happened, where it's from, how it affects people, why it affects people differently, nothing. All we know is some can still speak, some can still read and write. Those who are left-handed seem to be much more reasonable, level-headed. They aren't as driven by their emotions versus those who are right-handed who are the exact opposite. They are less reasonable and more motivated by their emotions. And in this chaotic post-apocalyptic world, the biggest emotions people are dealing with are anger and fear, right? Um, it's not that the virus turned them angry and violent, it's, it's not being able to communicate, not be, and, and just the world sort of falling apart around you, and then not being able to talk about it or read anything or write anything. Um, most people who are, and you know, right-handed people make up the you know, a larger percentage of the population, they are being controlled by their emotions. And at this point in this pandemic's, you know, aftermath, those emotions are still anger and frustration, which leads to violent outbursts. Uh, and that's kind of understandable. It's just, it would be super difficult. <laughs> but Rye realizes that the man in the police uniform is much like herself, much you know, more reasonable and less driven by those emotions. So she feels somewhat safer with him because of that, although she is still not 100% certain that he is trustworthy. So Rye goes with the uniformed man. She begins calling him Obsidian. They, change, they exchange little tokens to indicate their names. So like Rye shows him a, a thing of, uh, like a little pin of wheat, right, Rye. Uh, we don't know if Obsidian ever realizes that it's Rye. <laughs> he may have, in his head, been calling her weak. <laughs> Just like she sees the little stone that he shows her, and she, it's Obsidian, so that's what she starts calling him. But we don't actually know if his name was Obsidian. That was just the best he could do to kind of indicate who he is. Just like her little wheat pen was the best she could do. Um, but, you know, she calls, she begins calling him Obsidian and they ride away in his car. Obsidian reveals that he can still read and write, right? 
which causes Rai to feel a pang of anger and jealousy because she cannot read or write anymore. And it used to be something she loved. It was like a part of her being was reading and writing. The pandemic took that from her, right? She can still speak, but she can no longer un understand written language. When she finds out that Obsidian can, she can't help herself. She feels that, that moment of, of anger and jealousy. Uh, so her, they're not void of emotions, these left-handed people, but she's able to, you know, damp it down, recover, right? She's not controlled by her emotions, but they're still there, <laughs> right? Um, right, so she has lost those abilities. She has lost her family. It has prompted her to even take her own life at times. Um, but, you know, so she gets over those feelings of anger and jealousy and reveals to him that she can still speak uh, and understand spoken language. So they cannot communicate in any type of traditional manner, um, but they find some common ground, Ryan Obsidian do, which eventually, I don't even want to say eventually, pretty quickly leads to the two of them having sex in the police car, right? And that seems probably very random, but at the same time, if you think about it, it's not just you know, that natural drive to want to have sex and being possibly deprived of it for who knows how long. It's, it's more about the connection. She hasn't had anybody um, for quite some time. Her family is gone, like her, her spouse and children, they're gone. Um, and that, you know, we found out in the beginning of the story, the bus ride was to try to get to whatever family she may have left. She's not even sure they're there, but she thinks they're there. And so she's making that trip to go see them. And so when she meets Obsidian and she realizes that this is someone who understands her, um, isn't trying to hurt her, isn't trying to take advantage of her, uh, you know, and she's not interested in taking advantage of him. Uh, they, they, have this connection and they've probably both been deprived of any kind of connection. Um, very lonely and isolated during all of this. Uh, and so it was like, once they realized that they could trust each other, close her off and they're having sex in the police car, right? Um, she asks Obsidian to come live with her, right? Uh, they're both lonely, they're in this very strange new world and. They know they can trust each other. Um, and so Obsidian agrees and they start driving back towards Rai's house instead of to her family that may or may not have been there. They start driving back to Rai's house and all of a sudden this woman runs out into the street followed by a man with a knife. So Obsidian stops the car and gets out to help and the strange man and woman end up stabbing each other. And as Obsidian reaches down to check on them, the man grabs Obs Obsidian's gun and shoots Obsidian in the head. The woman, the man, and Obsidian, all three die right there on the street. And Rai is left in shock, not sure what to do with their bodies. She decides she's going to bury them, but then she's met by two children, who we can only assume belonged to the woman, because her children, um, the one that died. Rai happens to overhear them speak and realizes they are like her. The virus has not taken away their ability to speak and communicate verbally. But no one who speaks, no one who has the ability to speak still does so on a regular basis. They keep it hidden because those who are more affected by the virus and prone to those violent outbursts, they cannot handle the fact that others can still speak and use verbal communication when they themselves no longer can. So Rai keeps pretty silent most of the time. These two kids, when one of them starts talking, the other one says, shh, you know, like we have to be quiet. That's what Rai overhears. And the fact that these children are now without a mother, they can speak just like she can. She, like she's compelled to, to now take care of them. So she introduces herself, tells them not to be afraid. 
uh, puts them in the car so they can come live with her. And for the first time in a very long time, Rye feels like she has a reason to live. These two children have given her hope. Uh, so it's really, I don't know, it's a, it's, it's a strange story, like what happens in it. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's so intriguing. This story always piques my interest every time I um, go through it with a class. Let's take a look at the literary elements that we've been studying in each of these short stories. Look at how you know each one of them manifests in the story and how they all work together to show us the themes. All right, so our structure, kind of a typical story structure. You know, we've got our exposition, which is like you know our background information. Um, it's the first thirty-six paragraphs. It's everything that pretty much happens on and outside of the bus. Then we have our rising action. This is paragraph thirty-seven through seventy-nine. Um, everything that happens in the car. Right, while well, Obsidian and Rye are together. The climax is when the woman darts out in front of the car, they get out, everybody dies except for Rye, right? Um, that's our climax. That's when, like, what we've been building towards building this relationship between Rye and Obsidian, and then it being just snatched away in the blink of an eye. Uh, oh, I don't know about you, but I always feel for her in that moment. Um, and then our falling action is Rye dealing with the aftermath and realizing the children can seek. And then our resolution or denouement is the last like seven paragraphs. And it's when she decides to take the children with her in order to teach them and protect them. Um, so certainly, you know, I, I think that qualifies as a pretty decent climax. It's not necessarily a happy one, uh, you know, with the man and the woman and obsidian all dying right there within seconds of each other in the street leaving rye alone again um, definitely not the high moment we would have hoped for but as far as you know dramatic structure goes that that is the climax that's what we build towards and what we fall from <laughs> is that moment um so it's a pretty standard structure our point of view is limited omniscient so um the narrator is like that third person narrator someone on the outside looking in not a part of a story not a character but they only have access to one character's thoughts and feelings and that would be rock um and it makes sense that our that they wouldn't use rye as a first person narrator considering how difficult communication is in the story it would not make sense if Rye was the one narrating and like speaking directly to us, right? Um, you know, she can still speak. The, na the, the narrator is able to understand her and so are we, um, but she's a woman. So using her voice and speaking up isn't always the safest choice. So it makes sense why even in the narrative, you know, aspect, this point of view would still be an omniscient point of view instead of Rai being the narrator. It would not have fit with the story if Rai was our narrator. We may have connected with her more, perhaps, but it would not have made sense given what is happening in this story and what and how communication and, and inability to communicate and fear of communicating is so prevalent. Like we needed an omniscient narrator and we get a limited omniscient narrator. So at least we do have access to what Rye is thinking. Right. Setting and atmosphere. So the story setting, so again, it's set in the future, but it's not too distant, even for 1983, uh, you know, that's a few decades ago, even reading it now, it's not like it seems like it's, it takes place in a time gone by. There's enough uh, familiar landmarks and uh, items that we could easily think that this, that this story was written and takes place right now, and that this 
weird, you know, unknown pandemic has done this to society. So it's not like, and that, and that's on purpose because if it's set too far in the future with things that we don't recognize, things that we don't understand, then the effects of the pandemic aren't as powerful. Butler sets this in a current timeline so that it's a little scarier for us to think, you know, to see a story where something like this takes place and it not be in the crazy far future, that it's like right now. It could happen right now. Um, we know it takes place in California because there's mention of Pasadena, the LAPD, right? We know there's some sort of breakdown in society due to this virus or illness, and most everyone has lost some ability to communicate. Not that we are unable to communicate at all. It's just that each person has lost some element of communication. You never know what element the next person still has or lost. Um, so it ends up sort of turning into this world of chaos and violence. Um, and that's sort of the norm at this point in the pandemic's aftermath. Um, the atmosphere is very tense, especially those, the, the first part of the story, our, our exposition section, and even part of our rising action when they first are driving around in the car together. Um, it's a little tense, right? And, and, and they do, a, uh, Butler does a really good job of developing that, that tension. It's also, there, there's an angry atmosphere. Nearly every character we meet experiences anger in some form, even, even those that, we, you know, we don't know the names, but the people on the bus, the bus driver, um, the man and the woman, everybody is prone to anger. It's a very tense, angry atmosphere and on top of that is this feeling of despair so um their people are angry they're jealous they're feel fearful they're lonely it all converges <laughs> they are all the things uh and it is not a very hopeful optimistic place at all so um this physical setting and this physical virus that has happened, the aftermath, the effects of it, what it does to people literally man it causes this it, atmosphere in the story that leads to this atmosphere being created where it, it's, it's just tense and angry and full of despair. And that might be another reason why it's such an odd story to read, uh, because it never really lets up until the very end, uh, when she gets very excited about taking these two children in under her wing. But even then, <laughs> it has been so much tension and anger and despair throughout the story that even when we get that little glimmer of hope, from Rye at the end, it's almost like, whew, girl, good luck. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know how that's going to turn out for you. Not looking good. If I had to place a bet, I would be very much uh, placing my bet on something bad happening to you yet again. Um, and that's just what the story has created for us because the atmosphere is so strong. Um, that, that even we as the reader aren't necessarily, you know, hearts bursting at the end, so happy for her. We're a little like, like clearly, <laughs> nothing, nothing good or happy is allowed to happen in this post-pandemic reality. So it's not look, it just doesn't, doesn't seem like it's going to turn out well for her. Um, I mean, obviously, once we kind of think about it, the more we can sort of see, okay, maybe, yes, that was our sign of hope. That was our light at the end of the tunnel, you know, because then it raises some other questions about um, did these children, were they born already when the pandemic hit? 
and they lost the ability to read and write but can still speak just like rye were these children born after the effects of the pandemic after the pandemic hit can they speak and read and write how would it but we have no idea because we don't we know nothing about this pandemic but when we think about that ending and then we think about it a little more then we start coming up with more questions and more possibilities uh, as to what life will be like um, as the years progress. Um, and it's very dismal right now, uh, but will it stay that way? Will they recover and sort of rebuild society? Maybe. Maybe that's what we're supposed to get uh, with Rise Optimism, taking the two kids in. Um, but there's no answer to that. There's no resolution as to what will happen to society, because that's not really what Butler is pointing us towards. Butler wants us to focus on what is happening now in society, in this reality. We're going to get to that too. All right, so our imagery, is, this is a weird one for imagery because everything is through Rye's eyes. Um, you know, and it's almost all imagery, <laughs> which makes sense because, you know, we're getting this from the omniscient, the limited omniscient narrator, who is sort of translating to us what's going on with Rye. And since Rye does not allow herself to speak very often, even though she can, it's one of the, again, it's one of those things where she has to be careful and protect herself. She knows that if others know she can speak, they will become angry and jealous and possibly violent. So she stays quiet most of the time. Because she stays quiet most of the time, all we really get from our limited omniscient narrator is what Rye sees. So there's not necessarily anything specific or important about any individual image throughout the story. You know, like where, you know, like, oh, this imagery shows us this, and, you know, the imagery here shows us that, like it has for a lot of our other stories. This is really more just about how the imagery reaches us and why. That's how it sort of connects to what's going on in the story. The imagery that we receive is pretty much the whole story from start to finish. So much of it is just what Rye sees, what she's observing. And that makes sense because that's really all she allows herself to do when she is out in public is simply watch. She doesn't speak. So, the whole story is imagery because of that. It's just really kind of cool. All right. Then we have our symbols. Ooh. Um, quite a few symbols in this story. So, guns. Guns make, you know, are uh, referred to several times throughout the story. Um, and obviously it comes in, you know, a gun is used at the end. That's how Obsidian dies. But he keeps his gun on him as a warning to others. Um, so it's, it kind of, you know, the gun is sort of a symbol of order and peace because it serves as a warning. It often helps keep the peace by deterring violence because these people who are driven by their emotions and are so angry and jealous and resentful all the time, uh, they're, they're not stupid. <laughs> you know, they haven't lost their mental faculties, per se. Um, it's just they there's there's something that the pandemic has done that has increased their emotional drive. Um, but they're not stupid. <laughs> so when they see obsidian or someone else carrying a gun, they're not gonna, 
you know, they're going to do what they can to not mess with that person. They're going to try to control their emotions or leave, <laughs> get out. Um, so it helps maintain order and peace because it is a symbol of violence that is being used to deter the onset of violence. But it also, of course, represents chaos and real violence, right? She admits suicidal thoughts, right? Does, and she always carries her gun. Um, she is acutely aware of her gun during that moment when she becomes very jealous that Obsidian can still read and write. She is like, she feels it. It's, <laughs> and that's in that moment, she's having to convince herself to calm down, to not let her emotions rule her actions. Um, she, she is thinking about that gun during that moment. Um, and then, of course, the man, the random man and the woman, the man uses Obsidian's gun to kill him. So it's no longer than used to keep the peace. It becomes an opportunity to allow that anger and jealousy to manifest, to, to show itself as violence. So there is this very thin line between guns symbolizing order and peace and chaos and violence. That is a very tenuous line. Meaning sometimes, I mean, it's like, it can, it can teeter either way. When you're walking that line, um, you know, it's just, and again, it's because we know that Obsidian, you know, and Rai too, their guns are there to help deter people, like as a warning, right? To help keep their own peace. But then Obsidian's gun gets used against him. So that's where I, what I mean by the gun being that symbol of that, that fine line between order and peace and chaos and violence. But I think the coolest symbols are actually their names. Um, so Rai, she has a name symbol, a pin that looks like a stalk of wheat, right? Uh, Rai. Rai itself, the wheat, is a grass or grain that is very hardy and versatile and is able to grow and thrive in poor conditions. So did Butler give her the name Rye with this stalk of wheat as her name symbol to get us to think about how Rye in a field is very hardy and versatile and able to grow and thrive in poor conditions, just like Rye the character is doing. Um, it could also be a nod to Catcher in the Rye. Oh, geez, I mean, never read that. It's fantastic. You should totally read it. Um, but the obviously the title of the book, Catcher in the Rye, and the protagonist of that book, his name is Holden, and he um, he has very deep seated distrust of adults um, and fancies himself the protector of children, much like Rai becomes at the end. So very cool symbolism with her name, not just that she has a symbol for her name, but what her name itself symbolizes, right? Symbolizing Rai, party and versatile, able to thrive in poor conditions, and then perhaps also this nod to catch her in the life. Um, very cool. Then we have obsidian, right? He also has a name symbol, which is the pendant, the smooth, glassy black rock. Um, and obsidian is a volcanic glass. It is thought to have healing properties, right? So obsidian is thought to be a protective stone that absorbs negative energy. I think he did that for Rai. Obsidian is a stone that draws out stress and tension. I think he definitely did that for Rai. 
Obsidian is a stone that brings clarity and clears confusion. Um, and I think that he did that for right, you know, when she realizes that she can trust him and she's not gonna try to make this dangerous journey to find what family might still be alive. She decides that she can stay if he's with her. Um, his death also brings about clarity for her. At first it was, you know, confusion and sadness and all the, all the emotions with the two children, she's able to see with clarity um, what she needs to do. Uh, obsidian is a stone that is thought to dissolve emotional blockages and ancient traumas. Does that for right? Obsidian is a stone that promotes compassion and strength. He does that for right? And it helps you know who you truly are. Um, so I really doubt that this was a coincidence that Butler chose to name this character Obsidian. Um, even if that's not really what his name is. It's what she chose to have Rye call him based on the name symbol that he shows her. And all of these properties of obsidian make perfect sense. Maybe even more than Rai's name does. And I think Rai's name fits her tremendously well. But obsidian's name is like, holy moly, like, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he's obsidian for sure. Definitely. 100% uh, carries all of these traits. And of course, that's what she named it, obsidian. Now, what does all of this lead us to? Um, the structure of the story, the setting, the atmosphere, um, uh, the point of view, the imagery, or how we get the imagery, the symbols, leads us to our themes. Um, our first, you know, it's really only one theme, but it's kind of a three-pronged theme. It's communication, right? So first we have communication and isolation. Without the ability to communicate, humans cannot easily form bond, bonds with others, right? Um, and again, it's like people who can speak would probably fare okay with other people who could still speak. But again, you don't know who that's gonna be. And you wanna take that risk of showing that you can still speak, not knowing if the person you're speaking to is one who can only read and write and gonna get super angry and jealous and, you know, kill you. <laughs> so it's not easy to form bonds with each other without the ability to communicate effectively and safely. She, Rai has lived, a, is living a very lonely existence. Um, one that she has considered ending altogether. She tells us that she has, you know, it's, it's definitely been uh, something she has considered was taking her own life because of this, uh, the isolation that she has to endure because of these, you know, horrendous communication difficulties. Then we also have communication and peace. So nonverbal language, like open, uh, open carrying, openly carrying a gun, promotes peace because it's a deterrent. Um, and Rye and Obsidian's ability to communicate, even though it's, you know, he, she can speak, he can't, but they find a way. And that ability makes Rye feel safe and hopeful. So the inability to communicate has led to isolation. Finding ways to communicate can lead to peace, right? Both peace as in deterring violence and peace as in personal internal peace. But the biggest 
prong of this theme is the connection between communication and violence. Um, without the ability to communicate effectively, people are susceptible to miscommunication. They are susceptible to jealousy, anger, rage, and violence. People basically turn into animals with no humanity if language and communication is broken in some way. Um, and the hope that she feels at the end, I kind of mentioned this before, it comes from you know, when she decides to take in the two kids. Um, it's completely dependent on the possibility that this virus, that this illness has run its course and that language and communication are returning. That's why she's hopeful is because she, the, the, these two children being able to speak makes her think that the worst has come and now, you know, there's only one, you know, it can only go up from here. Like we've already reached rock bottom. These two children being able to speak, that's our sign that we're going to start climbing out of this. Um, but who knows if, if she's wrong and the language doesn't return, communication doesn't return, what happens then? And that's what we're left wondering. It's like, okay, this is a really crappy place to be right now. This is a crappy time period. Um, you know, this inability and fear of communication um, leading to isolation. Uh, and while it can also bring about moments of peace, it mostly brings about violence. Um, you know, and what are we going to do? What's going to happen if it doesn't get better? Like, what if she's just fooling herself? Um, and the rest of the story, like I said, or when I was explaining, you know, summarizing it, um, why wouldn't we think that the worst is going to happen? The worst hasn't happened yet, that it's going to get worse, you know, that language isn't going to return. We have been given no reason to think otherwise throughout this story. Like every time there is a moment of hope, it was snatched away. Right, like this moment of hope that she's gonna make it to see her relatives um, and hopefully they'll still be alive. There's actually a bus. She's actually gonna be able to do it. And then fight breaks out and ugh, okay. Meet subsidian, right? Moment of hope. They can, they have bonded, they can find a way to communicate. He is going to come live with her, and then boom, he dies. <laughs> So we get to the end and we have this moment of hope where she's going to take these two kids who can still speak and she's wondering if that means we are on the, you know, on the, the far side now, things are only going to get better, this virus is going to run its course and the world will go back to normal. Why wouldn't we think <laughs> that she is sadly mistaken and it's going to get ripped right from her again? That's what the story has set us up for. Uh, but at the end of the day, we don't know. We don't. Um, but we are supposed to wonder. We are supposed to wonder if if she's right or if she's just being, you know, hopelessly optimistic. Um, or, you know, and if she, if that's the case, if if we really think that her hope is misplaced and that it's not going to get any better, what does that mean? What is this? What what happens next? Uh, does it get worse? What does worse look like? What does the world look like? How do we exist in it when we cannot effectively and peacefully communicate? And that is why when you read this story, if you feel like it was something written today, it's understandable because despite the fact that it was written in 1983, uh, it feels current. 
obviously we've had a pandemic. That's kind of almost um, coincidental in my opinion, <laughs> because when I say that it feels like it could be happening today, I'm not even talking about the pandemic itself and the illnesses from it. Uh, I'm talking about our inability to communicate effectively as a society. And yes, certain parts of the pandemic certainly brought that to light and made it painfully clear that we have a huge communication problem in our society. But I'm not saying it's not really the pandemic itself that makes this story seem so similar to our reality recently. It's really more about what happens to people when we are not able to communicate safely and effectively. And how much longer do we have until we end up like Rye and Obsidian, even without a pandemic that took away, literally took away our ability to speak or read and write, right? Our pandemic didn't even need to do that. <laughs> our pandemic didn't need to take away our ability to speak or our ability to understand written language. It didn't even need to do that. It just needed to be. It needed to exist. And we were able to start chipping away at communication. I mean, it's already been getting chipped away at. Uh, but I do think that we live in a time period where, uh, in my children's lifetime anyway, especially my boys, they're seven and eight right now, um, that, that communication block, I don't mean blockage, like that communication component, we've been chipping away at it. Uh, and perhaps our pandemic caused bigger chips or faster chipping, um, but either way, we were already uh, starting to destroy the ability to be critical thinkers and to you know, communicate effectively. So that is one reason why this story seems so appropriate <laughs> to read in this course because there are so many parallels and yet we read the story and it still seems so unlikely. Like we cannot imagine what Rye's life is like on a daily basis. That seems crazy. But yet if you really start to think about what this story is showing us about communication, then we can start to see that maybe we can identify with some elements of this very strange, mildly sci-fi story. <laughs> but I hope you guys like it, because I think it's really interesting. Um, but, you know, all this information is gonna show up on the short stories exam, of course. So if you have any questions about the structure, point of view, setting and atmosphere, imagery, symbolism, or theme for this story, definitely reach out so that I can go over it with you in more detail um, so that you are fully prepared to answer questions about this story on the short stories exam next week. Okay. All right. Otherwise, you guys are free to go ahead and move on.